And our speaker on Wisconsin is Stephanie Luce, who teaches here at Murphy with us. And um, she is a former Wisconsin resident. She received her PhD in sociology and an MA in industrial relations from the University of Wisconsin at Madison um, a few years back. And she went back there in the spring of 2011 and closely observed the events that she'll be talking about today. Um, apart from that, Stephanie's conducted extensive research on living wage campaigns around the country. She's the author of a book called Fighting for a Living Wage and many other publications on that topic. And right now her research focuses on globalization and labor standards, labor community coalitions, and regional labor markets. Her most recent book came out last year from Polity Press and it's called Labor Movement's Global Perspective. So that'll be our first presentation. And then after Stephanie, you'll hear from Jesse Sharkey, who we're very honored to have here today because he's a very busy guy at the moment, as he'll explain. He's the vice president of the Chicago Teachers Union, which is planning a one-day strike on April Fool's Day. No comment. Um, he's been the vice president of that union since, <laughs> since 2010. Um, prior to that, he spent 10 years as a history teacher at Senn High School in Chicago, where he also served as a union delegate. Um, prior to that, he studied history and education at Brown University, and um, he was very extensively involved in the 2012 Chicago Teachers Union strike, which I'm sure he'll have a lot to say about today, um, and as well as what's been happening since then. So, um, oh, I'm going in the wrong order, I'm sorry. Um, in between the two of them, we'll hear from Perrette Talley. Um, PD is her nickname, and she's the secretary treasurer of the Ohio AFL-CIO, um, a position she's held since she was elected to it in 2002, so she's been there for a while. She was the first woman to hold a top office in the Ohio um, AFL-CIO and has been in the labor movement for much longer. She started out as an office administrator for AFSCME in, um, in Ohio and then sort of worked her way up. Um, as secretary treasurer, she has many duties, but um, she continues to work as a grassroots activist around all kinds of different issues, including living wage ordinances, advocating for affordable prescription drugs, fighting for a fair minimum wage, and voters' rights. Um, she has uh, a bachelor's degree from the University of Toledo, which I'll, those of you here this morning heard from uh, another University of Toledo person, Joe Slater. So. There's a little something there. She serves on the national board of the A. Philip Randolph Institute. She's active in the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists, as well as the Coalition of Labor Union Women and the NAACP. Um, and so she's going to tell us about what happened in Ohio when they, the AFL-CIO there successfully fought back against a Wisconsin-type law, which was passed by the legislature, but then reversed in a popular referendum which the labor movement successfully led. So that's a very important um, set of stories and lessons for the rest of us. And finally, we'll end the panel with Barbara Bowen, who is um, our local union leader here at CUNY. She has been the president of the Professional Staff Congress of CUNY, my union and the union of many of you in the room, um, since 2000. That union represents 25,000 workers, faculty and staff here at the City University of New York. Um, prior to becoming a union official, Barbara was a professor of English at Queens College and the Graduate Center for 15 years. She's a scholar of 17th century English literature. I think that's less active right now, but nevertheless, <laughs> should be noted, and African American studies. She has a PhD from Yale and has published extensively in, on those topics. Um, she also, throughout her academic career, worked in progressive political movements and as an organizer, so she was a natural person to rise to her present office. Um, besides being uh, a, the president of the PSC, she is an AFT vice president, a member of the New York State Union of Teachers Board of Directors, and she serves on the executive board of New York City's Central Labor Council. So as you can see, we have a star-studded um, panel here, and I think they're going to have a lot to share with you that will be of interest. So without further ado, we'll start with Stephanie. Uh, okay, so it's great to see you all. Thank you for having me, Ruth. And yes, I spent some time in Wisconsin uh, working with my political mentor and professor, Joel Rogers. And um, so it's, it's a real heartbreak to share this story. But I think by talking about Wisconsin, the bar can feel so low that the other stories are going to seem like huge victories. It's going to feel great. So, um, <laughs> And they are some good victories. So um, I also, I should mention too, I am now a member of the PSC and I'm wearing my um, wristband to authorize, uh, that I will vote for a strike authorization, um, but you'll hear about that in a minute. Okay, 
So, uh, Wisconsin. Um, all right, so I think most of you know this is a terribly depressing story. <laughs> Starting uh, in February 2011, the newly elected governor, Scott Walker, came in also with a Republican-controlled legislature and announced uh, a budget bill, Act 10, that was presented as a way to deal with the state's budget deficit, but was really a, a way to go after public sector unions and also public services as well. But the proposal would basically gut uh, the ability of of uh, workers to do, of uh, unions to do anything, would limit their ability to collective bargaining to just wages and then put a cap on, on that bargaining to the cost of living. Um, and it would require un public sector unions to recertify their unions every year with 51% of the vote of all eligible workers in the bargaining unit, not just of those who voted. Um, so uh, some of the people in the labor movement we're ready to give up. The teaching assistance union, my former union, um, said we're gonna fight back. They fought that. Students uh, got involved, other unions got involved. Teachers in Madison and, and other parts of the state engaged essentially in a, in a walkout, um, in a form of a, uh, a widespread strike. Um, and for weeks they occupied the Capitol and protested in Wisconsin. And many of you, maybe also with me, went to Wisconsin. People from around the country were supporting um, the protest. In the end, uh, the protest failed, Act 10 passed. Um, supporters tried to then recall the governor and some of the state senators, mostly that failed as well. So most of the fight back um, efforts were not successful. So that is uh, the sad story, but we're gonna uh, talk a little bit about what's happened since then. Um, okay, so it's been five years, um, and I think we've already seen one of the slides, but the results are absolutely devastating. Um, five years later, uh, we see that public sector unionism has been cut in half in the state. Now, uh, union density overall in private sector has been declining, and public sector was also somewhat declining it already, but it's been, uh, went from a, over, just over 50% of public sector workers to just about a quarter. Um, when you look at specific unions, you can see that there's variation, uh, just the, the big ones, NEA, AFT, AFSME, dropping 30% of their members, 50% of their members, 70% of their members. Um, and in fact, most of the AFSME uh, locals decided to not even bother to try and recertify. Um, and so you can imagine if the members are dropping so drastically, you can also imagine what's happening to their budgets and their staff and their entire operations. It's, uh, it's quite serious. Act 10, also also mandated that workers pay more for their pensions and health care and basically resulting in a wage cut, maybe up to 10% for some members. So really joining a union and paying dues for a wage cut, uh, there's you know fewer and fewer reasons to even join a union. Um, so it's not, you know, there's not a lot of incentive there for, for workers to do that. Um, but Act 10 was about more than just an attack on public sector unions, and Walker has been about more than just an attack on public sector unions. Uh, Walker and the state uh, legislature have gone on a full-scale onslaught attack. The things that Gordon talked about this morning, just a sample of some of the Walker attacks, everything from reproductive rights to expanding the powers of the police to engage in strip searching, expanding property rights, environmental uh, deregulation. Um, they're trying to do some of the things North Carolina just did a couple days ago, like making it mandatory that you have to use the bathroom that, of the gender you were born with uh, as a way to penalize local communities from having transgender bathrooms. So it's a full-scale attack on every level um, and just hundreds and hundreds of terrible pieces of legislation. And most all reports suggest morale is very, very low. People report feeling that their neighbors think that if they're a public sector worker, they're lazy, they're stealing from the, the public um, good, that they are the enemy, uh, that they cause the crisis, things are pretty bad. Okay, so are there any signs of hope? Um, and uh, you know, what can we maybe learn from this? A few things I wanna highlight as potential uh, support sites signs of hope. Um, the first is that it may be possible that Walker has reached his plateau. Um, his approval ratings are very low, about 37%. Um, they were dropping even a year ago, and then they dropped further as he ran for president. It may just be that he's gone too far, that they've cut too many services, cut too many people. Um, it's also the economy's you know, not doing that well. And if you compare Wisconsin to Minnesota, there's lots of different ways to do that. Very different forms of governors and uh, legislation, and very different outcomes. If you look uh, just at uh, household uh, median household income, you can see that Minnesota has been going up. Wisconsin has been 
uh, relatively flat. Poverty rates have gone up in the state. Um, there's all kinds of measures that suggest that people are hurting. Um, and no surprise, Governor Walker's plans haven't solved the economic issue. Um, and so people are not into Scott Walker. He has some of the lowest approval ratings of all the governors in the 50 states. Um, so that's maybe a sign of hope. Maybe he's reached his end. The second, um, sorry, the uh, second sign of hope is that, hey, some unions are still alive. <laughs> and that's kind of remarkable. So there's a high barrier to being a union member in Wisconsin, and there's little incentive. And you can think of it, there's still over 100,000 people who are volunteering to pay, sometimes over $1,000 a year in dues, to belong to an organization because they want to be part of a union. Um, and keep in mind, winning 51% of the total bargaining unit. Um, Scott Walker wouldn't have won any of his races if you had that measure. You know, he only gets like 25% of the voting population total. So it's a really high bar to get 51%. It can be done as Chicago teachers have done, but uh, it's a high bar. So anyways, there are some unions that are doing it. They're recertifying their, um, the Milwaukee teachers is one great example. Uh, they have four units. They have teachers, TAs, uh, substitutes and accountants. They recertified with over 70% of all their bargaining units voting and 99% voting yes to stay in the union. In Racine, 87% of teachers voted to, um, uh, went out and voted and 98% voted yes to recertify. So that we have still public sector unions can be considered a victory. And then a third sign of hope, I would say, is perhaps the formation of the Wisconsin Working Families Party last summer. And I know, you know, Working Families has had, you know, some challenges here in New York with uh, how the, the relationship to Cuomo and, and uh, public sector. But I think in Wisconsin, it shows the sign that people are getting fed up. The Democrats were the heroes during the Act 10 protests, but the Democrats haven't been the friend to labor for a long time. And um, in fact, in 2004, the cities of Madison, Milwaukee, and La Crosse passed citywide minimum wage ordinances, uh, the kind of thing Seattle and San Francisco and so forth are doing now. The Democratic governor and legislator went in and overruled their right to do that. So Democrats are not um, always the friend of labor. And we've seen in Wisconsin the Democrats continue to run pretty lousy candidates over and over. Right now, for county executive, um, the Dem they're nonpartisan races, but the, the candidate is a son of a billionaire, vetoed the living wage in Milwaukee, uh, friend of Walker. Um, so these are the kinds of some of the kinds of Democrats. So I think the Wisconsin working families party effort established last year with a, a coalition with SEIU, UAW, AFT, the Milwaukee Teachers, Wisconsin Jobs Now, and they're recruiting some new activists from community organizations and unions to run for office. They're running for county executive against that guy I mentioned. They have 11 candidates for city and county races, and they have a good shot at winning um, some of these races. Um, their plan is to create a political project, not just run candidates. They have an active slate, um, and they want to uh, really build a, a political coalition and then maybe extend throughout um, the state. Okay, so uh, fine. Uh, okay, so some lessons. Uh, those are three possible signs of hope, and some lessons to maybe come out of this. The first one is just this can happen to you. Okay, so I think no one in Wisconsin, maybe, I don't know, maybe Joel believed it could happen, but, and, and Harold Meyerson said we should have all known these things were coming, but I don't think people would have predicted places like Wisconsin and, and Michigan hitting this kind of battle. Um, it can happen to you, and not just public sector unions. The attacks on public sector unions are coming with attacks everywhere else. They're an entree to cut public services across the board, LGBT rights, environmental rights. So anyone who thinks it can't happen in New York, really, um, this is, it can happen to you. So <laughs> um, the second thing is just, as others have said, this is not just about Scott Walker. He is an evil person, but it's obviously not just Scott Walker. He shows what a well-funded, ideological, well-placed governor can do. But um, obviously, many other governors are doing this. Many other politicians are doing this. And again, Democrats are doing this, too. We have Cuomo here in New York, whose number one enemy is CUNY. In my old state of Massachusetts, the Democratic governor, Deval Patrick, outlawed public sector unions' right to bargain over health care. So it's not only the Republicans. Many. Um, 
uh, politicians are on board with this, that we go after the public sector unions. Um, so understanding what's behind this, it's not just about those politicians, but why are people voting these people into power? Why have they allowed um, the, uh, the Republicans or these kinds of politics to take over is the question we've been trying to ask since the Reagan Democrats, what's the matter of Kansas, with Kansas and so forth. Um, it's what we need to solve. Um, but so a few, a few other lessons is, is one, and I'm gonna draw on some of the things that already came out this morning, is that really it can't be about each election cycle or each seat. It's really about a much larger vision. Um, Walker tried to present a larger vision. He still is presenting a larger vision of what he's about. Um, and the unions that are succeeding in Wisconsin are doing that too. They're saying that we have a purpose of this union. We want to be a union for the, the bargaining for the, the common good. So the Milwaukee teachers, they've had this vision for a while. It's not just in SAC 10, but they've been about a more form of social justice unionism. They've been affiliated with the organization Rethinking Schools. And for a long time, they've had the orientation that teaching is also about defending the profession of teaching and about introducing social justice in to the curriculum, about fighting school closures, and approaching uh, education holistically with parents and teachers. So they're promoting a vision of a union that is has a bigger uh, purpose than just the contract. Um, and uh, uh, Peter Rickman, the co-chair of the Wisconsin Working Families Party, said it's, it's, it's probably less about like, evaluating the success of the unions in Wisconsin right now is less about recertification, because you could choose to not to recertify and believe you have more leverage not recertifying. But really the question is, do you have a vision of why you have a union and what the union's all about? Um, and so that's one of the lessons that we need to uh, take out of this. Um, now the teachers are lucky. They're connected to a national reform movement of education unions that we'll hear more about. Not all unions have that, but really that's what we need is national vision of why we have unions. Um, and that connects to with the, again from this morning the need to do deeper organizing and to, to remember the political game just won't work. It's not working. Um, now we can uh, uh, trash ask me a lot. I, I know we can do that. I, for a minute I want to defend on the other side because I have a lot of friends and students and former students who are AFSCME staff reps. And imagine you're an AFSCME staff rep in the, in the Midwest and you have to represent 10 locals with different municipalities. All of them have been under budget cuts for the last 10 to 20 years. All of them are facing outsourcing, speed up, um, uh, budget cuts, in, bargaining impasse. Imagine you have bargaining impasse in 10 different places. You know, so you're really stretched. You know, this is, it's not as if people aren't trying and there's a lot of fantastic people working really hard. It's just not a strategy that can win. It won't work. Um, and, uh, you know, not to pick on <laughs> people too much, but one of the quotes uh, of an AFSCME leader uh, in Wisconsin when asked, what are you doing to rebuild the union, said, we're going around explaining to workers how much a union can help them and why they should pay dues. So um, this is a vision that is, is relying on trying to target races, trying to rebuild unions in the old way, trying to like do one electoral cycle at a time and abandon the shop floor organizing and the one-to-one -one organizing and, and go at a legislative strategy. Um, really what AFSCME might do is do something like what some of the unions are doing and saying let's stop trying to have a staff-driven solution here or a legislative solution, and we need to really rebuild at the grassroots uh, in every workplace. So again, the Milwaukee Teachers has a worker leader in every school. They know they cannot do, be a union simply relying on staff. You'll never have enough staff to do it that way, um, and you ne really need to build from the ground up. Milwaukee Teachers, yeah, they started by getting lists of every possible member in every school and then making sure they had leadership committees there. Um, okay, so the old model, the political game, doesn't work, um, and particularly I should have mentioned the Republicans in Wisconsin engaged in heavy redistricting. There's redistricting, I think, that maybe prevent the Democrats from ever being in office again. So, um, so that particularly makes it seem unlikely that, uh, I mean, of course they can win the governor's race, but. Um, okay, and then uh, two last points, uh, which is, uh, first is that the Wisconsin story, I think, just mirrors the national story, which is that so much of this is about race. And we came out this morning, but it is so heavily about race in Wisconsin where there's an, an understanding about the cities and Madison being, um, well, particularly Milwaukee, um, around a race story. And I think 
you know, many people have said this, but our unions have just failed so um, often to put this at the forefront. It seems like it's a potentially divisive issue, a dangerous issue. We tend to try and focus on the win-win uh, stories. Everyone benefits from a wage increase. Everyone benefits from fairness. Everyone likes working families. So let's just talk about those safe terms and not address the really hard stuff. We really only talk about it in ways of like diversity. So um, Jennifer's data this morning that this is a serious attack on black workers in the public sector. It's an attack um, on black workers ideologically. Uh, uh, we have to address that seriously. And again, I'll just highlight the Milwaukee teachers. Um, one of their projects is working with 19 community partners, including racial justice organizations, um, to put out a vision of what schools can be that serve the community. They've critiqued the new Jim Crow of Milwaukee schools, and they're building, uh, you know, promoting a vision of schools that would work for students of color. Okay, and I think I'm just about out of time. So the last point is, that's talking about the hard stuff. The unions also, ha they have, you have to be bold on talking about the hard stuff, but you have to be bold about talking about the easy stuff. So as Gordon said, a lot of the issues we care about are easy. People like them, they care about them, um, and we shouldn't be so afraid to be much more bold in the way we talk about them. And Wisconsin is just another weird example of these polls that continue to show that Bernie Sanders would be Trump <laughs> or uh, um, Cruz. He's, you know, the polls are changing. These are already maybe out of date from day to day. He may lose to Hillary, but he would beat the Republicans. So that shows that we can't give up on the Wisconsin voters. Um, they vote Scott Walker in, but then they like Bernie Sanders. They do care about class issues. Again, all of the issues Gordon laid out earlier are the issues that we can be talking about. So going into the workplaces, talking about the hard stuff, but also talking about the easy stuff and naming the enemy. Thank you. As I was re preparing for what I might say, because 2011 happened, you know, several years ago. It's like five years ago. I don't remember what happened yesterday. Um, I went to my closet and I pulled out a roller bag, right? It was full to the gills. It weighed about 25 pounds. And literally what was in that bag when I opened it to start to go through it was all of the stuff about the collective bargaining fight in 2011 in Ohio, and that wasn't even all of it. That was just what I had managed to um, put away uh, for reference sake. So uh, this this is a, a really this was a really big deal for us in Ohio. So I'll start with 2009. While on the campaign trail, candidate for governor. Um, then John Kasich, who is the same presidential candidate, John Kasich, sounding very moderate today, um, sounding very union friendly today. Um, he told his supporters at a 2009 fundraiser, and I quote, we need to break the back of organized labor, end quote. Right? He went on to say in his acceptance speech, um, after edging out Democratic incumbent Governor Ted Strickland, quote, if you're not on the bus, you're going to get run over by the bus, end quote, right? So you New Yorkers, y'all remember that when y'all go to y'all primary election. He is not what he appears to be. Uh, we know him uh, very, very well. So Senate Bill 5 um, was introduced in February in 2011 on February 9th, sounded, signed into law by Governor Kasich on March 31st, less than 60 days after it was introduced. A bill that would overturn 30 years of collective bargaining rights in the state of Ohio. It impacted 400,000 public workers. Um, basically, it would prevent unions from charging fair share dues. You heard about that this morning for employees who opt out. It would restrict the ability to strike and collectively bargain for health, things like health insurance and pensions. Um, and they positioned the bill ultimately that a yes vote meant that the voters uh, wanted to keep the law that had just been signed, the pa passed in 2011, and a no vote meant that they would repeal the law. We luck was on our side in in terms of how the position, how the issue got put on the ballot because no votes tend to do better than yes votes, right? Um, so we had the same thing in Wisconsin, right? We were watching the Wisconsin fight play out. Um, basically, so the lessons learned in terms of uh, 80,000 union members and supporters showing up at the Capitol, we was like, we got to get people to the Capitol. We got to get people to come and testify against the, uh, against the issue. So we had the protests. We also sat in on negotiations um, with 
Republican legislators, and who we sent in was a secret weapon because when John Kasich got elected, he enjoyed union support when he ran for governor. There's a lot of union members in, in, in teachers' unions and even safety unions and maybe... Um, excuse me? Can't hear you. Can't hear you at all. Can't hear you Hello? Hello? Is it on? Yeah, oh. Numbers on that? Three. Okay. Okay. You know your slides are cycling through very I, They shouldn't be. I don't know that yeah. they, yeah. they need it. You'll be able to use that uh, quicker later, but take this one. Okay. Yeah. Ooh, I hear my own self. Okay, yeah. this is good. <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, it, just like in Wisconsin, we had the uh, protests, hundreds, of, tens of thousands of union members um, and, and going to the Capitol uh, to rail against the bill. Republicans had a plan, though, because they did things when the bill was moving, like um, take Republic, certain supportive uh, legislators off of committees, right, so that they could get the bill through the committee process ultimately get the get the bill through the floor they were switching out even their own republican members who were supportive of not repealing collective bargaining uh in ohio so the referendum process um in in ohio we we had the ability to overturn uh voters have the ability to overturn bad law bad bad bills that get signed into law you basically need to start with about a thousand signatures um and from the time three days after the bill was turned turned into law to get the process going we turned in 3,000 signatures so we kind of felt like we had some momentum going into this campaign Right? A referendum in Ohio mainly takes 90 days to gather signatures. And so we needed to gather roughly close to a quarter of a million, 231,149 signatures that needed to be verified to get on the ballot. And Ohio has 88 counties. The signatures needed to come from half of those counties. So that's 44. And not all counties in Ohio are union friendly, right? So we thought we were really up against it, and, and, and I guess we were. So in June, fast forward from, from, from April to June, we were closing in on three quarters of a million signatures <laughs> with a validation rate of 60%. And that's pretty powerful because one of the things going into the campaign we thought was that we needed to perhaps buy signatures because that's what you do when you got a ballot issue, right? You know, you can't get the volunteers who care about the issue. Um, you can't get enough juice from those volunteers. And so uh, we, we had a validation rate of 60%. I'll tell you a little bit why I think that is later on. And in uh, June of 2011, our coalition had submitted a record setting 1.2 1,297,301 signatures to Quali try and qualify for the ballot. And the secretary treasurer um, has a little bit of time to validate those signatures. And he's certified of the 1.2 million uh, signatures, petitions we turned in, he certified 915,000 with a validation rate of 70.5%. So we're on the ballot, right? We're ready to go. But we have no idea what it's gonna take to win this campaign or whether or not the general public and even our union membership even have an appetite uh, uh, at that point to, to do this whole referendum piece because we didn't know where the money was gonna come from. Uh, let me back up a little bit and just say this. During the legislative process, um, unions like police and fire try to sit with the legislators that they have a relationship with that these legislators have received endorsements from these two unions and try to get them to do something different. And they actually ended up being appalled that these legislators had a game plan. They were not interested in changing the bill, making it easier or anything. So it was really an uh, interesting dynamic that played in, in our favor because had there been any kind of carve out for safety forces, I'm not so sure we could have um, had the outcome that we had. Anyway, we're on the ballot. Right now we have to win the campaign once we are on the ballot. So in March of 2011, Ohio's top union officials called a meeting to discuss the strategy. 
And this meeting was different than any of the meetings that we've been in, right? Any of the meetings I've sat around the table in, because there, you could feel that there was a sense of an imminent threat, and that if we didn't get our arms around it, it we were going to be Wisconsin or even worse in a state like Ohio. One union leader said, this, and I quote, this is not about an election swing. If we don't pre prevail in killing Senate Bill 5, we don't or we won't come back from this. And he went on to say that his union, which happens to be my union, asked me is ready to strike. I mean, and just having that kind of conversation in the room let us all know that we needed to do something different. This is not like running a political campaign or any of the stuff that we, any of the kind of legislative fights we've been in over time. And so it was a really uh, different dynamic that we were actually facing. At that time, though, there was really not unanimity around the question of this whole referendum campaign when we met in March. Uh, unions, uh, both inside the Federation of Labor and outside the Federation of Labor, they needed to kind of weigh in, uh, not only in terms of what we were facing, but in terms of what it was going to cost to pay for this campaign. So they set up a subcommittee, we set up, I say they, we set up a subcommittee that would establish the question of whether or not we were going to really go to the ballot. Um, a steering committee of public sector unions seemed to make sense to us. So you had AFSCME, police, fire, teachers, nurses, uh, education association, OFT, the usual suspects sitting around the table. But we also put on the steering committee CWA, communication workers. They represent a small number of public sector unions. Steel workers represent a small number. Uh, all, everybody in Ohio represents a small portion of public sector unions, so we had to cast this as everyone's fight. Um, but more importantly, we set some ground rules, right? We had to reach consensus on whatever we were going to do and look through a broader lens than just our union, because we knew we had to really fight together this time. Um, and so we had to agree upon like an infrastructure that was going to run this campaign. And quite frankly, we felt whoever was going to run the campaign needed to be a, a, a neutral uh, operator, right? Not coming from any of our unions, right? Uh, so that we could make sure that uh, it was going to be run um, as, as well as it needed to be because we understood what was on the line. And basically, the steering committee basically just served to set policy, right? You know, well, how are we going to do uh, vendors and how are we going to get the signatures and what's the training going to be and things of that nature? Um, what is our strategy to get on the ballot? Um, you know, all of that stuff. So we're setting policy while an independent um, grouping of people that we ha all had to sign off on is going to run the campaign. And in an earlier panel, someone said uh, they, they made the point about many of our campaigns or many of the activism gets turned over to like political operators versus union activists. Um, and we made, a, we made a choice. It's like, okay, we're not going to run this campaign ourselves. We're actually going to hire um, um, uh, you know, people that have political experience because that's what it takes to win this campaign. Um, but they were friendly to labor, so that, that was a good thing, right? So as we're setting policy in the campaign, ground rules were we had to exercise the highest level of discipline. Whatever the messaging came out to be, we all had to stick with it and stay with it. No mavericks, nobody was bigger than anybody else at the table. Uh, because we were serious about getting this thing won. Um, and there was this, the components that it takes to win a campaign, right? Getting the petitions, you know, where should we pay for the petitions? Should our members help get the petitions? And the reason we had a 70.5% 70, validation rate was not, we paid for some signatures, but the, 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 the validation rate that came from the paid canvas people was much lower than the validation rate that came from the volunteers, which were our rank and file people, our union activists, and members of families and other outreach, out, outreach uh, folks that we had to outreach to. Um, getting to the win was really challenging, though, right? I mean, we, we had to do all of this, OK? Um, we had no model, really, for 
who is a no on Senate Bill 5 voter, what that looks like. And so having a political operator uh, to walk us through all the uh, steps that it takes to win a campaign was really uh, very, cre very key for us. We had to broaden the table. Um, and bring allies in, and, and, and we really kind of came to a place where we understood um, that the messaging that we agreed upon, which was that um, gutting collective bargaining is unfair, unsafe, and hurts us all, was really a good message, and that the impact was going to be on police, fire, teachers, and nurses. But these slides that are cycling through on the screen, uh, because everybody had a voice at the table, those of us who kind of work in both the labor world and the, and the civil rights world, uh, we kind of understood that it would be difficult for black voters in Ohio to go to the polls to just to save the jobs of police officers, right? Because the relationship is tenuous. And so we were able to kind of get the campaign to say we need some nuanced messaging that puts the face of this campaign right where it's at. And it's women like Emily that works in the Cincinnati school system. It's women like uh, this sister here that drives bus for the school system in Cleveland. Uh, and so we actually were able to kind of get some uh, different faces in the campaign. And at the end of the day, and I'll kind of wrap this up in terms of where we ended up, uh, we won. Uh, voter turnout in that election year was 46%. That was pretty high. <laughs> we won the issue 69 to 31. And um, Black voters um, in the state supported repeal of this issue in higher percentages than union households because we took the time to broaden out the coalition, not just with black folks, faith leaders, small business people. Uh, that's how we were able to get the number of signatures uh, that we were able to get. And exit polling showed us um, that uh, regardless of, uh, we asked the question, regardless of how you voted on issue two, should public employees who work for city, state, government, or school district be allowed to engage in collective bargaining over wages, benefits, and working conditions such as staffing levels? This kind of gets back to what the panel this morning was saying in terms of what, are, what is the scope of bargaining. 66% said, Yes, public employees should be allowed to collect a bargaining, and 57% of those 60% said definitely they should be allowed to, uh, to uh, uh, engage in collective bargaining. Numbers a little bit higher for union households. And then we asked a final question because we wanted to know, we wanted to tease out the appetite for whether or not if this issue came up again, we would have the support, the broad support that we had uh, across Ohio. And the question was, if Ohio voters reject issue two, should Governor Kasich and Republicans in the state legislator, uh, should they try to pass a similar legislation again? Um, what do you think? I, I, I think the Republicans should move on to other issues uh, versus try to pass similar legislation. Voters felt 60% that they should drop the issue and move on compared to 34% who should uh, try and pass similar legislation. So this campaign was won because union leaders exercise a discipline that we never had. These are the takeaways. We were highly coordinated in ways we never have been. We kept our egos in check. And y'all know that's hard to do among union folk, right? <laughs> um, everybody got a say. You didn't, even if you were not the president of the AFSCME local or the, or the police local, everybody got a chance to say, and we had to build consensus. Uh, we had to have resources. We had to think of beyond our own interests. And also, it was that hybrid of, you know, political operators in the room and, and carrying out this campaign right along the side of union activists. And I think that's why we saw a different kind of outcome. And I'm sure we'll get questions later because you all probably want to know if, if the issue, if another issue like that came up today, are we ready to win it since we built it five years ago? And I'll be happy to answer that if someone has that question at that time. Thank you. Thank you. Sisters and brothers, hello. Sisters and brothers, hello. hello. All right. 
Um, I'm Jesse Sharkey. I have three dilemmas before I even start to speak. Um, the first one is that I'm at that age where like, I, I need glasses to see you guys, but I need to not wear my glasses to see what I'm, I've written down. So I have to decide, like, if you guys are going to throw stuff at me, uh, I'll need to keep the glasses on to be able to duck, um, but if I, I won't be able to read my notes. So um, I don't know which way to go. You guys are going to throw stuff at me? Uh, I'll, I'll go with reading the notes. Um, the second dilemma I have is that um, I don't have a, a, a well typed out and written thing. I, um, so I, I'm going to kind of just I'm going to talk until it's time to stop. It, 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 and I won't be. It, it'll be hard to see Ruth. Is, is, can someone in here volunteer to wave their hand at me when I have five minutes? They have fifteen total, right? Yeah, I'll pass your notes. Oh, you'll pass it to me. That's great. Okay. That, that, uh, so Pat, can you pass me one at, at five minutes to go, and then one at two minutes to go, and then I'll. And if I'm not done talking, you just you can actually like get a hook or something. Good. All right. And then the. Um, um, you know the the well. That's enough. We'll we'll, we'll do that. Um, so I, I want to just begin briefly by acknowledging the difficulties in the period that people are talking about. Um, those d difficulties are, are legal in nature. Um, certainly in Illinois, they passed a series of laws which were designed to restrict the bargaining rights of unions. Um, people heard that there was this famous one where they said, the CTU, and it was affected just one union, the, CT, the CTU um, cannot go on strike unless 75% of its membership votes in the affirmative. And there was like a lot of actual high fives going on the internet at the Aspen Institute and other, other kind of um, wealthy think tanks saying, ah, we, we snookered them, they're never going to get that. Anyone who doesn't vote counts as a no vote. Um, and of course, we've now done it twice in a row. Um, it's interesting to talk about how that works, but I, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, we've seen, um, we, obviously, there's been a lot of austerity in Illinois. Um, oh, yeah. Chuck, Chuck. I'll use the podium, that's fine. Yeah, give us just a second, we're working on it. You just can't see him. Continue using the mic. Oh, is it better? Okay. Um, would it be better if I use the podium? Yeah, the podium would work. Okay, that's Come into Never, um, never mess with your AV people. They're very important. Um, OK. Um, now I've got to wear my glasses, because not standing up there, I, I, I need to at least see you guys if you're like really scowling at me. Um, so austerity, obviously, and, and over the last five years, there have been a series of cuts in the public schools um, where they've cut, we think, a couple of billion dollars out of the schools, um, rescinded contractually guaranteed wait, uh, raises, um, done round after round of mass layoffs, cut special educators, um, et cetera. Um, and then um, we've seen racial injustice piling on. Uh, uh, school closings, which targeted schools in black and Latino neighborhoods in particular. We've seen the percentage of black teachers in CPS over the last 15 years fall from 40% to 20%, so, so um, uh, fall in half. And then the, the unions have been beleaguered. And so, I, you know, and, and I don't want to, um, I don't want to sort of like spend too much time in the point. I don't want the audience to get beleaguered. Um, but I do just want to begin by acknowledging that there are some real difficulties in this period for all of us. Having said that, though, I, I, I want to begin with this point. That for a period of time, the size and fighting readiness of the forces that are arrayed against us are greater than the forces that we control. I'll repeat it. For a period of time, the size and fighting readiness of our, our enemy's forces are greater than our forces. Deal with it. Stop saying, I can't believe it, or can they do that, or you know, how can this be? It is the way things are for the next period of time. Now, we believe in this room, I hope we believe this, that things must and will change. That that, that that current state of affairs is not the permanent state of affairs. Because if you don't believe that, why are you dedicating your life to this movement? And if you're spending your Good Friday in a room doing this, and you haven't dedicated your life to this movement, you, sh you should start. Um, 
<laughs> you really are, actually. No, you are. We, because, because we are. Because we actually, because, I, you know, I, I, I just was, I, I'm, I got here a little late by playing out in late, and I, and I had a series of questions about who's in this audience, and I might as well ask it now. It'll, it'll help me think about what, what we need to talk about. Who in here is in a union with show of hands? All right. Who in here um, holds elected office in a union? Who in here uh, works for a union? Um, who in here writes about unions? Okay. Um, who in here believes in the power of the working class to change society? Yeah, me too. I, th and, in, and in some ways, th that's, the, th that's it, isn't it? That is, we're, we're doing this because we actually are fighting to win. We're fighting to win. And it, we have to acknowledge that we're in a difficult period and understand and have an analysis of that and then, and then really move towards what gets us to victory. Um, I mean, and so I'm going to talk about some lessons from the CTU, really in the context of how we fight and how we win. Um, and I, I, you know, and I, I guess it, it would be worthwhile just to say that, like, if we fight, we win is too simple of a formulation but like I, I want to start with it because you know if you're in a if you're in a Department of Human Services office and there's 200 of you and you're fighting against the governor, you feel a lot less powerful, right? And, and that's true. I'll acknowledge that. But believe me, far greater figures than Andrew Cuomo have fallen. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, right? <laughs> and in the end, the the power of our enemies does not rest on their popularity. It rests on their wealth. And, and, and so we, we live through a period of time that where, where they've been able to get enough people to forget about that, that they don't rely on, on weapons and money. They're relying on votes. But if we push them hard enough, the pretense will fall away and it'll, they'll become exposed as people who rely on their, on their wealth and power. And in which case, their popularity will begin to fall away too. And, th and, then, it will be, and then it will feel like a more natural fight. Um, and, 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 and we'll start to chip away and win. Um, we've been too timid on our side, too quick to say, I, believe, I don't believe they can do that. Or, you know, we did our part, we gave concessions, and now I can't believe they're not acting fairly towards us. Um, so l let me, like, try to get into a, a little bit of sort of, like, um, sort of the, 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 where the CTU comes in. And, and I, the, I think the first thing about the CTU is we just adopted a theory which said that um, we are going to try to be clear about three things. Um, we are going to try to be clear about the idea that as public educators, we had a, a series of allies, people who were in basic solidarity with us, pe people who um, had the same fight as us. And those are the people who depend on public schools and public services in general, and that we were going to that we were going to make common cause with that group of people in our fight, that we were going to try to adopt common bargaining demands, that we were going to see the issues that were important to them as important to us, and that we were going to act on that over a period of time. The second thing that we said is that we were going to be clear about the fact that we had some opponents. Um, that is say, our, our opponents were people not just who sat across the bargaining table from us, as defined most narrowly, but were also people who didn't believe in public education, who didn't believe in funding um, uh, services for, uh, as part of the public good, who wanted to like, attack the public sector in general. Um, we believe that our opponents were part of the economic 1%, that our opponents were racists, and we, we would use l pretty offensive language, some thought, but you know, we'll call it like it is. If what you do is you lower your own taxes and then and you create a funding crisis in, in, the, in the state and in the city, and what they do is they close all the mental health clinics in the black neighborhoods, what is it? It's racist. So, you know, so we tried to, we tried to be specific and name some enemies. Um, and then finally, we decided that we were going to try to take a fight, and that fight was going to, we were going to try to conduct that fight in every arena in which we could conduct it. And we did do legal fights. And so, you know, we, we filed lawsuits, and, you know, those lawsuits made their way through their court. Um, we, uh, we, we fought in political campaigns that continue to do. So we, we fought elections, and the sister who talked about um, the election campaign, uh, you know, that, that's something that, that uh, is important work. Um, but... We ultimately said that we, uh, really, okay. Um, <laughs> you giving me credit for the mics um, here? 
because your mics are broken. You, you know. um, <laughs> give me an extra minute. Um, the 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 um, we said we're gonna our ultimate power though is our power to withhold our labor. The the power of unions is it comes from the power at the workplace, which are a nexus of where people come to work every day. They connect community. They connect. Um, uh, everyone who, you, you know, our, our, our membership, etc. cetera. Um, and so, you know, it, it's like too often in public we can't strike. Well, what does that mean? We're, we're, we're not bonded labor. You know, we're free labor. We have the power to withhold our labor. It, you know, there might be judges that disagree with us, but we disagree with them. Um, and, you, you know... Um, so this is partly about like trying to convince our members, and then and then what that fight meant is that I'm not saying that you you your individual situation or union might be able to get to a, a 2012 strike. It, I mean our union couldn't do that right away, and it's continued. There's other kinds of fights, but in any given fight that you pick, you have to convince people that you're going to fight as hard as you can to achieve your aim, and if you're going to accept less and accept the loss, don't call it a win. Say that this is something which we fought hard to stop but couldn't stop. And in every situation, build the number of people who are part of your side who want to dedicate their life to building the size and fighting capacity of our own forces. Um, and that really was what 2012 was about. It was about going into a fight about the kinds of schools that we want, not lowering expectations, but raising expectations. So they would say, oh, your schools are failure factories. Well, you know what? I, it would be easier to pin me on defending bad schools if I hadn't spent the last decade fighting to make them better. Every cut that you tried to make, we fought. We couldn't stop you from making all those cuts. You imposed some of them. But, but you were the one trying to make the schools worse, and we were the one trying to make the schools better. So now how dare you come in and, and accuse us of defending bad schools? It's the opposite. And so by trying to raise expectations about what schools could be, we want to fight for the schools that Chicago students deserve, and we want to do that with our organic allies, and we're going to name who's actually like fighting against it. We were able to build a large, broad coalition in that strike. We were probably striking about things that were, well, I won't even say the word illegal. We were striking about things which judges would consider illegal, which we considered moral and right. Um, On April, right now in, in Chicago, on April 1, we're, we're planning a, a, a one-day strike. Um, and the boss is calling it illegal. Um, I think it's illegal, and I'm sure they'll find a judge who, you know, might think it's not. But um, the point is that it's a one-day strike, and we're demanding funding for our schools and for social services in this state. There's a budget crisis in Illinois. There hasn't been a budget for 10 months. Um, we intend to be joined by state and local universities who are closing for that day. Um, by healthcare workers, fast food workers are striking for the day. Um, transit has been part of our coalition. Um, there's about 20 community organizations that are going to be out. Um, uh, I could go, I could go on about it, but we're going to pick it in the morning at, at school work sites. We're going to go and hold rallies at universities in the middle of the day, and then we're going to converge in a giant rally to shut down Chicago's downtown. And it will be multi-sector. And it will unite workers in the CTU and also everyone who's affected by the public sector crisis um, to fight for the, for the f social services and funding for education that we deserve and to fight for racial justice um, because there's, all, there's, there's money for the school to prison pipeline. Um, but there's not money to keep kids out of that pipeline in the first place. And so, um, you know, those are the kind of demands that we're making. Uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up because I, I'm at time. Um, um, there's nothing that we've done in the CTU uh, that can't be done in other places. It might be the case that your union isn't, you know, where it's going to call a one-day strike in a, you know, in a big city and bring out a bunch of other sectors and shut down the city. Uh, it might be that you're fighting against a work rule change in your workplace that you don't like, or a policy, or, or something very small or local. Um, it doesn't, that's okay, but it has to be a fight. We have to stop expecting that, you know, our ability to do moral suasion works. It doesn't. Our enemies have a higher number of people and a larger fighting capacity than we do right now, but only for a time. But only for a time, and together we'll win. Thank you.
I really thank the organizers of today's event and thank my other panelists. Um, it's an honor to be with them and great to be in a space where we can talk about our own different fights, but not in a bureaucratic space. And I think too often, you know, we heard from Stephanie about the need for a national fight, and yet here we are so often um, separated in our separate cities, or when we get together, it's under the aus auspices of a giant national union structure, which tends to be atomizing and hierarchical, and we don't really get to put our campaigns together. And for me, that's the question of today. How can we put these fierce campaigns together and um, mass the power we're starting to mass? Because there are important things. We've heard about Ohio, Wisconsin. You'll hear about New York. We've heard about Chicago. Brilliant examples, inspiring examples. Yes, I agree with Jesse. They have, at the moment, the wealth on their side. And what they're doing in each of these cases is fighting to maintain that wealth and to maintain racist inequality. And that's why the fight is so hard. So, But we have some leverage. And I'd like to think maybe in our question period about how we can um, exercise that. So um, I uh, I think I'll just start by telling where we are. I'm the uh, representative or the uh, president of the union here at CUNY, and I see we have a lot of members. We have been in a long fight, which is a broad fight, because our governor announced at the beginning of this budget season that he would defund about a third of the state funding for CUNY, and he also has refused to put any money behind or into um, settling the contracts of state workers since he's been in office. It was something he ran on and something he has continued to do to hold to this created notion of austerity. So our fight is against that austerity. It's against the imposition of that austerity in a racist way on the people we teach here at the City University, where we welcome our visitors. Um, our undergraduates are 75% people who are Latino, black, or Asian, and more than half of them have family incomes under $30,000 a year. That's the population, and for most of our population, CUNY represents the one shot to get out of a life of permanent poverty in a culture that is determined to keep them in that life of permanent poverty while pretending to advance them. And I think that is the dilemma we're in, especially as teachers. The uh, dominant narrative in the culture is, oh yes, we're all about supporting, giving chances to every person, and yet at the same time making it impossible for those chances to occur and actually actively making sure that they don't actively making sure that the people who, who are at CUNY do not have access to the kind of education and small classes and time with their teachers that would allow them to do as well as they can. So I thought I'd show you a few, um, few slides. I hope this is going to work. Oh, where is it? Okay, uh, a few slides from our ongoing struggle this year, uh, starting with targeting our own chancellor, who lives in this apartment building. You can go visit it today on your, in your time in New York, paying $19,500 a month for his apartment on top of his $670,000 salary. And there we were, we gave him a wake up call. We came at 7.30 in the morning with 150 alarm clocks and 100 people from other unions and we woke him up. And uh, other people in other unions really enjoyed that. So that's his building. There we are, those are nurses waking him up. There's John Highland who might be here today, six years without a raise. So we started, this was not the beginning of our fight, but the beginning of this new phase, um, targeting the chancellor. We added to that and you see here some signs about tuition. At the same time that our raises were not being funded, tuition for students was um, pr proposed to go up. So we formed a coalition with students, and uh, again, there was a lot of effort in the state legislature to say, well, why don't you support an increase in tuition because that's gonna fund your raises? Uh, and we said, no way, that's not how to fund our raises, and continued that. So we started with the chancellor, and then we decided to meet. This is in Cooper Union. We packed that room and announced that we were going to take a strike authorization vote. And that's why um, I gave up my red bracelet that Ruth was wearing so Jesse could take one back to Chicago. But everyone who's planning to vote yes could, um, yes, uh, could sign up, and we're going to release those names. So we put up posters, I'm voting yes. We're putting on our red armbands and developed uh, a different 
a different arena, and this goes back to something we've heard earlier from our colleagues here, we are fighting on every arena, um, in every arena, fighting to develop our own membership strength, which is the key. I think we cannot do anything without that strength. And also other unions, other uh, community groups, are not inspired by you and do not feel, um, they don't, you don't have credibility with them if you haven't organized your own members. You know, you can't get them out in a line and you have a piddling representation of your own members. So it has to start within. Uh, it can't be a shell game, it can't be smoke and mirrors, it has to start within building person by person. And that's what we've been trying to do, one by one, conversation by conversation, trained people reporting back. Not always easy to get everyone to do it, but that's what we're trying to do. And then we have these beautiful t-shirts. Uh, I'd worn mine all night in the jail cell, so I, I spared you wearing it today. But it says, five years without a union contract hurts CUNY students. Sadly, people have begun to put a little tag over their five and say six. Um, but we are working on it. And here we are um, teaching in those t-shirts so that students ask. There's a group of faculty at LaGuardia talking to students, wearing the shirts. And students do ask. Students' parents ask and building that way. I love this because this is John Jay College of Criminal Justice. We have somebody standing in, si in front of a sign saying justice and talking to students. Building with students was, I would say, the next step. And as all of us know, these are not carefully delineated steps in a narrative. Um, they never work that way. You're trying to do all things at once um, and doing them imperfectly. I would say doing them imperfectly, but build within, uh, build with students, and then you'll hear some more. Uh, more with students. Uh, then also at the same time, this is in Albany, building with students at the legislature. Uh, not just building in the streets, but knowing that the votes have to occur in our state legislature and gaining their support. So we brought 400 students with us to Albany in the state capitol. They got on buses at 4 in the morning. They came to uh, be with us, and here they are. Uh, there's some Albany shots. There's another arena. Uh, at the same time, we're getting petitions signed and various things, and we're marching into the governor's office with those petitions. Um, it's funny sometimes to be in the mode of wearing your little suit and marching to the governor and then walking out and doing something in the street, but we're trying to do all of those things and leave nothing unturned in a fight against a massive defunding of our university and not only that, a fight where the governor has announced this uh, massive defunding. He has now been forced back on that because of the outcry. Um, but then, then, yes, yesterday. Yesterday, he announced that as we were doing the die-in, he announced that yesterday. But... Our concern is that that will be mistaken for a victory because there's an enormous amount of political capital that's being used to resolve that issue. Um, but resolving that just takes us back to where we were, which is a, an inadequate level of funding that has decreased under this governor, increases for tuition for students, and no contract funding for us. So by creating a massive exercise and a massive crisis, another created crisis, and then having to solve it, um, there has been the possibility that that will seem like enough, that staying with the status quo will seem like enough. And our fight in this next week, because the state budget's going to be uh, done on the same day, Jesse uh, is in Chicago going out on strike April 1st, we have to make sure in this week that the uh, hypnotism of the, the dominant narrative that it's enough to keep inadequate funding, that that does not prevail. So we've got a tough week, um, but here we are, still in Albany, I'll show you some shots. Other arenas testifying, again, in the halls of power, we are uh, leaving nothing undone. We are willing to go and speak to them, even though it's a very ritualistic exercise where they never do what you say, but we go, there we are, and there we are in some of those halls of power, moving on. We have music. How many of you have had bands at your demonstration? Live bands. Get a band. It's the greatest thing. High school bands, union bands. It's the greatest thing to have music. It changes everything at a demo. And college demonstrations, homemade signs, our signs, uh, demonstrations on college campuses. This is the uh, first sit-in we did in this struggle. We've done others. This is in front of our chancellor's office in November. Uh, I love that. And we locked arms 
and chanted, stop the war on CUNY, tax the rich, not the poor, stop the war on CUNY. We did that, there were 53 of us arrested, and it began to really, I think, change the narrative we were getting in the press. Um, it has been actually astonishing to me how there has been uniform, uh, uniformly condemning press about the Cuomo's um, intent to cut CUNY and very supportive press of unions. That has not been typical in this famously progressive state of ours, uh, which in many ways can be an anti-union state. And um, so we're very pleased that that has happened. And there you see this action. Uh, this is our own union paper. There's the beleaguered chancellor, good, and uh, calling on him to do more. Uh, and the other arena in which we began to work, and I'll, I'll end in a second after this, is uh, by expanding our fight. So we had targeted our own chancellor. We have tried to build our own membership strength one by one, talking to members one by one. We have uh, worked with students, trying to form coalitions with students. Uh, we could do much more there and broaden that support. It, to me, it was a beautiful thing when our student, the CUNY student government, which is off, often under the thumb of the administration, I don't know if you have seen that in other universities, but where the student uh, government staged a march across Brooklyn Bridge, and their chant, one of their big chants was about a contract for the faculty. I mean, for them to do that on their march, to understand that when we're fighting for a decent contract, we're fighting for the ability to teach them in the way we want to teach them. And to see that come together, I think, has been one of the most powerful things we've been able to do. So also working with students, doing direct action, and then we um, have built and worked with community allies to build something called CUNY Rising Alliance. Uh, which draws on labor and other community partners, and these are some of those partners speaking at a rally. Um, and we've rallied with them and marched with them, and they have put out the case too. I don't know, there's an article in the Times this morning where some of the members of this coalition speak out about how CUNY is their issue. It's a citywide issue, and we must continue to make it that way. And there they are. Our uh, colleague unions at CUNY, marching with them, AFSCME Union, going across Park Avenue, making traffic stop on Park Avenue. And um, this is a reading we had uh, with CUNY writers standing up, CUNY poets and writers standing and reading against austerity. Um, if we have a minute, I'll pull up the slides from last night, or maybe Aaron could help me do that while I finish. There are a couple slides from last night. But um, what I want to say is that we are very privileged to be together in this space. Thanks, if you would pull up just a couple of those. Um, and that often I ask myself, why is this so hard? You know, why are these so fights so hard? Oh, there we go, you can put them. There's our die-in last night in front of the governor's office with signs that say, don't let CUNY die. We did that chant that you just learned um, and that there we were. But one of the things I, uh, struggle with is why is it so hard? You know, we have so many people on our side. We have, uh, you know, CUNY needs a raise scratched in a jail cell. We have people all over the city knowing what's happening. You, all of us here, have talked about ways that we have built tremendous coalitions. I was in Wisconsin sleeping on the Capitol floor. I mean, it was such a, a flowering of desire and vision. You know, it was not just about I need money in my pocket, it was about that, but it was an opportunity to express a desire for a different organization of society and a vision of that society. And when we are expressing that together so strongly, and when we have gathered more and more allies to the point where you have so many people coming out in Chicago, and we have people stopping us in jail cells to thank us for fighting. Um, why is it still so hard? And I think the answer to that is that it's a measure of what's at stake. Because we would not have to fight so hard if so much were not at stake. And what's at stake is a whole order of racist inequality, which those in power are busily solidifying and concentrating, an order of militarization, an order of forcing working people into having lives that are unbearable and increasingly unbearable. And we're fighting a very big thing. And that's why it's so hard. So we will not win every single battle. 
we've got one week here, you've got a week till your action. We will not win every single battle, but I think the possibility for us here today with so many people who put up their hands about a different vision and all of us knowing very intensely that is the vision we want. Most people, if asked, would say that's the vision they want. We have to figure out the way to jump over existing structures of um, labor, I think, jump over those structures, think about that, because you, Jesse said, you, you, uh, your question was how many people think a working class movement could change the whole structure of society. I think our challenge here is to make this a movement. Um, and that's, that's where I leave us, and um, an honor to be here to think about it with you. Thank you very much. I've been waiting to ask this. How you are too. Okay, I've been waiting to ask this question since this morning. My name is Diane Jollis, and I'm from New York State Public Employees Federation. And I work for New York State. I work for New York State for the last ten years. I'm a council leader and executive board member, and I work in a women's prison up in Westchester County. Um, how do we change our image? Because what the image of uh, a public employee is, is lazy, um, the union and all the protections, nothing can ever happen to us. When um, a correction officer who makes, goes to work and just happens to do a lot of overtime because there's so few correction officers on the job, the newspaper puts in he made $100,000, $200,000. A New York State nurse, um, is way under a private hospital nurse, and when he or she hits that hundred, hundred and fifty thousand dollar mark, the first things in the newspaper: Why is this person making so much money at the taxpayer's expense? So how do we change our whole image? Um, I was driving to work one morning, and on the radio, a joke came up. What, did you, what does public employees do? Why doesn't public employees look out the window in the morning? Because they'll have nothing to do the rest of the day. Wow. So that's my question. How does our image change? Great, thank you. Let's take a couple more questions and then we'll have the panel respond. Um, how about you? Um, it's my, my understanding, I think I can do it better without it. It's my understanding that Binghamton University in South Central New York has gotten a lot of money. There's all this innovation. I'm sorry, I don't know all the details. Technology. So how, what's going on in with CUNY? That's my question. You know you have to have almost a four point to get into Binghamton University. Thank you. Awesome. Short but to the point, thank you. Um, and next from the woman in green. Hi, um, my name is Carol Lang, and I work at uh, City University. I work at Bronx Community College. I'm in the PSC, and I supported the strike authorization vote. Um, but if I was a psychologist, I would say, in listening to people who belong to the AFL or work for the AFL CIO, I would say, what's the matter with those people? Are they um, perpetually psychologically interested in shooting themselves in the foot? That they continue to to vote for? Um, the, Dem the, the Democratic Party, we have been encouraged by Barbara Bowen to vote for de Blasio and for Cuomo, who's our major antagonist in Wisconsin. In Wisconsin, the, 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 um, family, the, the family's party encouraged to vote for Cuomo in Wisconsin rather than organizing a general strike and bringing everybody out. Um, the AFL-CIO supported this recall vote of a Democratic candidate was just as bad as as the as Scott Walker. So time and again, as a historian, as somebody who's also a socialist, I understand that supporting the Democratic Party and supporting the bourgeois parties only tie the American working class to the ruling class in this country. Rather than calling on 
the workers to organize a general strike, even in Wisconsin. The Wisconsin, most of the people who went to the Capitol were white. There was, was no organizing in the black communities at all. Um, there was no desire to bring those people out in support of that strike. And unfortunately, that's the case across the country. The AFL does the most um, you know, simple kinds of things and telling people to go ahead and support the Democratic Party and to, to try to encourage those people to say that they're better than the Republicans when in fact it's been demonstrated time and again and, and the person from Wisconsin clearly said and, and, and showed us that, that the Democrats are no better than the Republicans and yet that becomes part of the strategy and a major part of the strategy of the trade union movement. I think we have to reject that. We have to start calling for a strike and we have to start organizing general strikes in, in the city and in the country if we're ever going to be able to win our demands. Short of that, then we're going to end up in the same cycle of poverty as we've been in all along. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, two, well, uh, one question was specifically about CUNY and Binghamton University. Um, and Binghamton, for people who don't know, is part of SUNY, which is the state university system. And New York has an unusual arrangement where um, the city university includes colleges, four-year colleges, and PhD institutions, uh, which is usually part of a state system, and that's because of our long history here at CUNY. Um, the, most of the funding, as far as I understand, not an expert on Binghamton, has come in through an initiative that Governor Cuomo has touted about bringing private business to universities. And he sees universities, and he's very upfront about this, as uh, ways to generate income because some of the state universities, not the city ones, have a lot of land, and he has made huge tax incentives for businesses to locate on that land because he sees that as wasted land. It should just be generating money. And a lot of money has come into profit-making centers and also to, um, to assist parts of the university that could eventually generate profit. So uh, that's my sense of the money pouring into Binghamton. Um, money is not pouring into CUNY and has not for years and years because there has been a conscious political decision to defund the university that would provide a chance for a stable life, an economically viable life for the poor, the working class, and the people of color of New York. I mean, that is why CUNY is not funded, because there has been a political decision in budget after budget after budget not to fund a um, first quality education, college education for the people who rely on CUNY and to make sure that their chance is not there. I mean, a student said to us the other day from Medgar Evers College, which is in uh, Brooklyn, uh, looked at some faculty and said, well, even if you go on strike, you'll be all right, even if you get fired because you have credentials. I have no credentials. And my only chance to get a credential is CUNY. This is life and death for me. Uh, it, that's why we thought about a die-in. This is life and death for them. So that's why I think CUNY has been unfunded. Um, it's, it's more complicated. SUNY has also lost fundings in the general fund. I should not set up the impression, I'll stop in a second, that funding for um, SUNY has been on the rise in general. It's for those profit-making centers. Funding for CUNY, for SUNY as well as CUNY in general has been falling. Public higher education has been underfunded. And I'll just say quickly to Carol Lang, um, I think others will probably speak to that, but, um, uh, and it's a complicated and good question. Why are we still marching people into the Democratic Party is one way of putting it. Um, and uh, just one correction, we did not urge any voters to vote for Cuomo. Uh, there was no endorsement of Cuomo by our union or our statewide affiliate or the AFL-CIO in the last election. Yes, but I, I'm correcting that part. So I'll turn it over to Colleen. Um, I just want to come in on the question of how we change our image. I, I think it's an important question. Um, I will say um, three things about it. Um, the first thing is that um, we cannot control the way the media portrays us. Um, um, what we control is what we do. And once we realize that like, what we're actually talking about trying to control is the way we, is, is, is our actions 
it, it's a little bit liberating because it can be really it can be really paralyzing to worry about what the world thinks about you um, when you don't control the world. You control yourself. So start with what you can do. And the first thing that that like it, it, think about where we were in Chicago coming into the strike of 12, the, the national anti-teacher union stuff was at a fever pitch, right? I mean, you had the Waiting for Superman movie and all the stuff about unions protect bad teachers, and the mayor in the city of Chicago had a very popular proposal about making school longer, and he was, a, a, you know, Obama is from Chicago and massively popular among the, um, the uh, black working class in Chicago, which is the critical constituency, and his chief of staff comes into Chicago and starts running a campaign against the teachers. And the amount of sort of self-loathing and self-doubt among teachers about that was really very high. Um, so what do we do? The, fir the first thing you do is you don't try to debate the argument they're making. If the argument is state workers are lazy, don't say, no, we're not lazy. Uh, you know, they said, unions protect bad teachers. No, we don't protect bad teachers. In other words, you, you have to stop debating about that issue on the terms which they've picked. It's like, you know, guys know that old joke about, like, when did you stop beating your wife? And there's no, like, good answer for that question because, you know, uh, right? And I feel like, you know, state workers are lazy. There's no good answer for that question. Um, because if you say, you know, um, no, we're not. We work hard. Then they'll, the next question will be, oh, well, then why don't you change the work rules that, that, you know, that give you breaks? What's up with all those breaks that you get? So, you, you know, the only good answer to that question, and this is the second thing I'll say, is that you have to put forward the things that we are advocating for that we know are popular in, in, in the public. So our, 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 the, the answer to that is, like, talk about what you, we are fighting for. No, you know what? We want to we want to make sure that the, the 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 you know the people who had a bad turn of life who wind up in my institution have a have a chance to, you know, to to turn their life around and do better later. And and, and we're and we're fighting for this resource. But I will tell you this: you cannot keep two sets of books. You can't, in reality, just fight for an extra quarter and keep your pension and don't give a crap about all the things that community activists want and then turn around and expect the community activists to forget about the fact that you were never there when it comes time for your contract. When I say, you know, let's fight for, you know, for make common cause, you actually have to do that. And if you do that, then you'll have something to help improve your image with. Um, but it, will, it, it also will allow us to build uh, an important alliance. Um, uh, did I say three things? I, maybe I can't think of the third one, um, and I've been going on too long. Um, can I just say the last thing? Sister, you know, in Chicago, we've done as much labor work as I, you know as I think we've done anywhere in the country. We've got a we've got a, a union that has a splendid group of activists. We're talking about a one day strike that we argue is legal. You know, I don't know about the judges, but we argue it's legal. And I and I will tell you that that is more than a notion. Like saying that crap is easy. Making it happen. When people's, you know, when, when like that actually means uh, being a no-call, no-show on a day of work in which you're going to be out in front of cameras trying to get as much attention as possible. When was the last time you tried to get your coworkers to do that? Right? Oh, and now, by the way, make it general. Like, uh, y you know, how many, like, how many other sectors can you get to go with you? So, uh, y you know, I I I'm all for it. That is exactly what we need to do. That is where our power is at, y you know. But, like, let's be cautious among rooms full of activists where we're being planful and, be, and, and trying to think about what the next step in the chain is about building our power, about like sort of like making a blithe, you know, blithely counterposing unions which are taking electoral strategies, often out of defensiveness and weakness, and what ultimately we are going to need to get to a point where we, where we can shut down cities with coordinated strikes that involve multiple sectors. Um, but that, that, is, that is more than a notion, and, um, and let's treat that whole set of things seriously. So uh, to the to the sister's point about why do in the AFL-CIO do we it appears that we continue to do the same thing over and shoot ourselves in the foot and, and back, you know, Democratic candidates who may not have our our interests. Um, I, I the, the history of how this movement um, runs is long and it's deep, right? And when you look at the top layers of power in unions or the federation. Um, it doesn't look like necessarily the workforce that it, it represents. And so um, I think we have, you know, as we think about um, 
how, how to do things differently. I think the diversifying our union leadership is a first step to kind of doing that because different people bring different perspectives and you get something a little bit different, right, out of, out of the approach. You get, you get people looking through, you know, challenging people to look through a different lens to try to kind of get to a different outcome. And I think part of it is like for us in Ohio when we were having this whole conversation about how we fight back, we had women sitting around the table for the first time. I mean, it, this was not necessarily the back, back room deal. Like, I mean, they, they probably had the meeting before the meeting, let's be clear, right? <laughs> but when we got at that table, those of us who were not white and male, we leaned in and we leaned in hard. And so when we lean in hard and we talk about, you know, and we appreciate the diversity and we set some ground rules where people have a say, where uh, there are no mavericks, no sacred cows, no uh, any of that kind of stuff, I think you can create some opportunities to get a different direction in terms of where we have been and where we're trying to go. And so it is hopeful that uh, we can um, at least, uh, when we're in these fights, have a broad enough um, uh, coalition sitting around the table and those ground rules get established where everybody has a voice, everybody has a stay. And I think for us in Ohio, I think those union leaders, because we are still pretty much white male dominated, dominated in terms of the leadership, um, I think they, they were a lot more open to what they usually um, are. And even if they cut the deal in the back room, there was some of us in the room that said that deal won't fly. It's just not going to fly in, and because we set ground rules that said it was consensus specific, um, we had we had to pivot and go in a different direction. Uh, okay, I just I was going to say something similar to Jesse about the general strike, which is just that certainly it's we need all tactics, but more strategy is really also what we need on the left and the vision of how we build towards our goals and what we're striking for. What it means to strike in the public sector is different from what it means to strike in the private sector, what the target is and so forth. Um, the only other, and the other thing is on this to public image, also just reminding people again, the Wisconsin protests, the Occupy protests, Fight for 15, all show very strong public support. When workers stand up and make bold demands for what's right and what's just, the public supports it. And um, I think it just highlights, again, we can't over strategize with the right focus groups. We can't rely on polls. Things can change overnight. And, and again, uh, Ruth and I uh, and Penny, you know, talked to all the key Occupy activists. Not one of them brought a sleeping bag down to Zuccotti Park. Not one of them thought they would spend the night there because they thought they'd be kicked out. We can't know what's going to work. We keep trying because we always have to fail a lot. That's what being in a social movement is. Some of those, you know, some of those failures turn into successes. But I do think getting the public on our side, I don't think it's as nearly as of a big lift as we seem to think it is. We share a lot of values. More, we share more values than we disagree on. Okay, we're ready for another round of questions. Um, let's start in the back this time. Paula, can, would you mind, or is there somebody with a mic back there? Great. Um, why don't you go ahead and pick somebody? Yeah. So um, the most radical thing. Sean, uh, identify yourself again. Sean Richmond, yeah. uh, uh, former AFT organizing director where I had the pleasure of working with uh, both Barbara and Jesse. Uh, the most radical thing that, that Sharkey said, and he's thrown out a lot of truth bombs, is the notion of, of a union leadership standing up before its membership and saying, you know what, we didn't win. In fact, we lost. Now join us and join the fight. Um, we're just not wired that way at all. There's all these jokes in the morning about how we spin our defeats as, as, as wins. Um, you know, union leaders are worried about re-election, obviously. They're worried about perceived union efficacy if we lose agency fee. Even, you know, some of the, 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 the sort of agency fee conversion work that's being done based out of D.C., um, the, the best of it that says, well, you got to connect the membership ask to a campaign almost always, and I'm speaking mostly for AFT, but I don't see why it would be different at NEA or AFSCME, almost all of it comes with the advice of, but you gotta pick a campaign that can win, which winds up being things like, you know, there's never enough chalk in the, in the classroom, and you know, I guess, I guess you could win that, but I'm not sure where the power is. So my, my question, and it's genuinely a question for, for, for everybody on the, on the panel, 
what is our process, what's our group therapy that gets more union leaders comfortable with being potentially proud losers? Um, Leo Casey, Albert Schenker Institute, which is affiliated with the AFT. Um, I wanted to encourage um, the panel to go into some more difficult kind of thinking. Um, it seems to me that it's a given that you need to organize a fight back. It's a given that we should be um, perfectly willing to engage in nonviolent civil disobedience. All that's a given. But if we are in a situation like Jesse described of asymmetrical warfare, um, it seems to me that strategy and strategic use of our troops and our resources is absolutely key. You don't have to have Red Gramsci, but it helps. Um, it doesn't make a lot of sense to send your best troops up the hill into the strongest point of the enemy. You have to figure out some way to outflank them. Um, with all due respect um, to the previous speaker, um, it doesn't make a lot of sense um, to choose ground to defend that you know is going to be overrun. You need to choose ground that you can actually defend. Um, so um, it's, it's, see, these are hard questions. Um, when, when CTU people um, get together and try to figure out um, when they were going to call their strike, it was very important that they had the leverage of the presidential election. Um, that's something that goes into the strategic thinking. Um, and made all of the work that they did in the community um, important um, and, and was actually able um, to be highly effective. So I think if, if we're really grappling with where we are now and how we move ahead, um, we have to take on um, these questions of strategy. Hi, uh, Abby Share. I'm an adjunct at Brooklyn College. I teach one course a semester, so I'm a member of the PSC. I'm also a member of the National Writers Union, and most of my income, because I'm an underpaid adjunct, actually comes from writing and editing. So I'd like to invite my president every time she talks about the low-income people in CUNY who go to CUNY to also talk about the low-income people who teach at CUNY. You know, so that when we're talking about not fighting. Uh, for the status quo to say explicitly the status quo is I'm an associate professor adjunct because I actually have a doctorate and skill, you know, the stature, and I make $3,800 a course. You know, if I taught four courses a semester, I'd make $30,000 a year if that was my only income with a doctorate. So, so when we're, t I really heard what the Chicago teachers union said, where we're envisioning a future, I want every time my president goes out and is envisioning a future, is envisioning a different future for the adjuncts who are at the bottom. So that's one statement. The second, the second thing, um, I actually write about this stuff. Um, I work in the me independent media, and I really hear, uh, I left an article I wrote five years ago after the 2010 elections. Um, for, uh, I worked at an independent think tank that tracks the right wing. It's called Political Research Associates. It's in Boston, not very well known in New York. Um, but our, when we're talking about, I'm, right now I'm, I'm writing about Pioneer and its attack on the public sector. Pioneer Institute is a right wing think tank that is attacking public sector unions in Massachusetts. Um, and they started with the explicit aim of changing the intellectual climate. And all of this money got poured in in the 1980s into these right-wing think tanks across the country to change the intellectual climate. Um, and it's, it was an explicit strategy. And I've worked, starting when I worked at Dollars and Cents and Economic Justice Magazine in the 90s where I was co-editor, you know, on up into Independent Press Association here in New York where I worked. I've been in the independent 
progressive media sector, and I've never seen, I've never seen an investment uh, in changing the intellectual climate in the, in the institutions that exist. Um, so as part of our strategy, I would like us to open out beyond the unions themselves and how the unions are engaging with the media and the other elements of the landscape that are equally engaged in this battle. Thank you. Um, let's let our panelists respond to that round. Um, why don't we start with Stephanie this time and go the other way. Oh. Sure. Um, Leo and Sean, who, who are, are both dear colleagues whose uh, who's thinking I um, uh, value a lot, um, both ask questions that sort of go to our strategic planning. And I, I will, and those are very thought, those are important and, and, and thoughtful points to raise. I, um, let me just say a few things about the CTU strategic planning process. You know, I mean, it's easy to give a kind of a stem winding speech and say we have to fight. But then when you think about what that actually means, there's, that's where the real art of actually leading an organization comes in. Um, and I will say this, that if we pick fights that we're sure we're going to win, we will, our, what it will mean is that our organizations will be sure to continue to repeat the results that they've been getting. Because that's, you know, what, what can your organization achieve? Your organization can achieve what it's been achieving. And so if you're happy with what your organization has been achieving over the last year, 10 years, 20 years, by all means, keep doing that. Um, what we do is we very consciously try to pick fights that we think we might win if things go right. And, I, you know, the rule of thumb I would use is 50-50. Like, if you don't think there's about a 50-50 chance that you can pull it off, it's probably rash and you should rethink that. But if you think that, that if you're planning every fight where you're sure you can achieve it, you're, you're, you're not giving our movement a chance to like actually expand and break new ground. And I'll give a couple of examples. Leo's, of course, right that in, in 2012, the coincidence of the contract expiring along with the presidential election was a strategic advantage. Um, um, but Sean is also right, that we were very clear with our members that the settlement in that contract included important losses. You know, for example, the amount of money, the, the amount of time the board had to keep someone on as to continue paying their salary after it closed the school was actually cut in half in that contract. Um, now, that of course became so, and, and we never tried to cover that, or and we, were, we were quite clear about it. Um, and there were a number of other sort of, sort of big kind of religious fight issues about the use of test scores and teacher evaluation, student test scores and teacher evaluation, um, things like that, which we fought about and sort of fought to a draw over. And there was other things that we won. But the, I, we were very clear that we saw this as a defensive strike um, and that there would be much bigger fights coming. Um, and that you know, we were, the, the, the board was at that point threatened. They took us to court on the Monday of the strike. Um, and uh, we were worried about our ability to stay out on an extended strike over basically what would be kind of religious war kind of issues, which were, we didn't have the right to bargain over. And our union took the, the decision to go back, not having won all the things that we wanted. That was quite conscious. And that was extremely important that we were honest about that because the next thing they then did was they ran a big school closing round at us, right? Where they tried to punish us when they said they were gonna close 200 schools. And the question, and if we hadn't been honest with our members about the shortcomings of what we'd settle for, it would have been hard to explain to our best activists why we needed to go into the next fight about school closings, which we had to take as a principal position, even though we knew we had a very small ability to actually influence the decision because school closings was not um, uh, you know, there's no democratic accountability in the schools. The mayor appoints the schools. They have a school closing plan. It was funded by Broad. It was going to be a very hard one. And, and so we fought that. We marched. We, we, you know, we, we, we went all out. And in the end, we lost. And they closed 50 schools. And we called that a loss. Um, but through the, you know, but my point is that what we did is we managed to maintain and actually improve the fighting capacity of our core of activists by being honest with them. And I'll just say one last thing. It, one of the things that I think that our unions lack is rank and file voice in democracy. 
um, far too little of it. And, uh, you, you know, um, it may, I mean, I'm a, an elected union leader. I do that job full time. Um, you know, it would be easier to win re-election if there weren't uh, a layer of really well, you know, informed, active people with lots of connections to the rank and file and whatnot. But, you know, the CTU just in the last two weeks moved an argument through our membership about a one-day strike that we hadn't been talking about two months before. How do you, and that's a pretty radical big step, right? The, you know, how many people's unions could get a, an 800-person delegate body to vote on a, on a one-day action, which the boss is calling illegal, right? That quickly, how do you do that? I think we didn't do it through staff. You know, there were probably 100,000 one-on-one you know, one -on -one this, one-on-one -on -one that. You know, they got all these, these acronyms about this, the, you know, how to teach organizing conversations. I'm not saying that stuff isn't important, but I'm saying that we probably had 100,000 one-on-ones. And um, no, no word of a lie. And those, were, those 100,000 one-on-ones were conducted by the rank-and-file leaders of our unions in each building, who we've been trying to build up and increase their confidence in fighting capacity by not lying to people about what our real challenges are and by giving and putting responsibility and letting people vote and letting the debates run out. And so that's just an important value in our, in our unions. Um, there's no easy answer to, to these questions, but I, I think that's kind of the, that's the process that we've adopted. Uh, thank you. Uh, first, to Amy Sure, you're absolutely right um, that the structural inequality, which absolutely dominates and deforms higher education and is part of the general disinvestment, which is the fact that as the money was withdrawn from public spending, uh, the the result of the of um, universities across the country was to uh, cut the costs of their biggest cost. Their biggest cost is teaching, so they cut that cost. And that's what led, not only that though, that's, that's partly what led to the massive use of underpaid adjuncts. The other thing that led to it though is not just money. It's the desire for increased control over the workforce. Uh, and we found this very, very strongly at CUNY uh, when we tried to bargain in the last round for um, a longer appointment for adjuncts so that there wouldn't be just each semester leaving the person in doubt whether you have any future at that place at all. That was uh, agreed to, uh, the, the idea that that was non-economic was agreed to by management. They agreed with us that that was a non-economic issue, that it did not take money out of the whole contract settlement. You might think that that might make it easier to win, right? You had said, you, I mean, we had also asked for parity pay for adjuncts on the basis of parity with full-time positions. That is a big economic issue. That would be undoing the whole structure, which has allowed them to have labor on the cheap, right? And not invest in the project of teaching the people we teach. That's what it's all about. Um, but a non-economic issue, a longer appointment for adjuncts who had been there, some of them 25 years, you would think that might not meet the same kind of resistance as an economic issue. And guess what? That was the single hardest issue to get management to work on in the last round of bargaining. Why? Because it was about control. It was about control. And nothing revealed to me more clearly than that, that for all the times that we've heard, I'm sure you've heard it, uh, university management types say, oh, you know, we wish we could have enough money to have a larger um, number of full-time positions and not part-time positions. They don't really want that. They want to have what they call flexibility, what we would call total insecurity. They don't want to have a secure workforce. They want an insecure workforce. So the adjunct system, much as it is bemoaned by management, uh, also suits them pretty well. Uh, and it is a very hard thing to crack. Uh, so I should have said that in this round of bargaining, one of the things that we are fighting hardest for and the thing that we have actually spent the most sessions on is an, an attempt to get a longer term appointment for adjuncts. Uh, we have gotten to the point that they're willing to agree to something on it and uh, to break through for the very first time at CUNY that wall of saying there will be no continuity, but it has been enormously difficult. And I thank you for raising it because it's right at the center of the economic issue and it's about our members uh, 
you know, several thousand of whom rely totally on the teaching at CUNY for their income, and it's a woefully inadequate income. I see here um, our former um, vice president for part-timers, Marsha Newfield, who can, um, I'm sure, talk more uh, at greater length than I can in much more detail about just what that means in people's lives and how, um, you know, I'd use an old-fashioned word, unbecoming it is for a university, which is supposed to be about passing on knowledge uh, and some kind of vision, how unbecoming it is, or maybe a better word is shameful, to practice that kind of employment practices themselves. So I appreciate your comment, Abby. I think you're absolutely right. It is certainly part of our practice, and, and I agree with you. Um, on the uh, questions raised by Leo Casey and Sean Richmond, and it's nice to see you here. I would say to Leo's question, there is a strategy impl uh, implied in the kinds of uh, narratives that we've heard from PD, if I can call you that, and Jesse, uh, Stephanie, and I hope from me. Uh, there are strategic choices at every step in the way, and I'm glad the next session is going to be more explicitly about that. But the wrestling with the deep questions of strategy, do you take a risk with your members? Do you fight for something that you think you're going to win, uh, not going to win? Do you ally with um, a certain group even though you can't share everything they they imagine, um, and what's the long-term strategy about broadening your fight rather than keeping more control of it and keeping your own issues. I think those are some of the strategic questions that might be implied here. Uh, and to Sean, I was thinking as you said that, you know, uh, I agree with Jesse that there are some fights you have to fight because they're the right thing to do. They're the principled fight. I think of the fight that we waged against this horrible downgraded curriculum that CUNY management imposed on uh, on us and our students called Pathways. We are still fighting it, I would say, but uh, we have not won that fight at all. It's been years. I still feel it's a fight we had to do, partly because as a union that uh, wants to create a culture where people can speak up and fight back, you can't let something go unchallenged. You can't just say, well, that is so awful that, and we know that we don't have the power to beat it because it's management prerogative, blah, blah, blah. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't challenge it because I think it creates, um, it creates loss, it creates defeatism if you don't challenge those things. So I think we have to go on challenging them and potentially losing some of them. I, I'm, I'm going to uh, add just one thing. I, I, I know I've been talking a lot. Um, the, if I can just underline something that Barbara said. <laughs> Sometimes you have to pick fights because of the way it trains your activists. And I'll give an example out from both the CTU and the UFT. Both of our unions took, the, the UFT took a position on the Eric Garner um, uh, murder, where, um, has it been ruled a homicide? No, the Eric, the Eric Garner, um, the Eric Garner, well, I shouldn't call it a murder. It was a homicide, though. He was killed, right? Um, uh, it, uh, you know, I, I don't, at any rate, the killing of Eric Garner, um, the UFC took a position and endorsed that demonstration, which was a difficult, which would cost them, it, there was a section of their members that protested that very vociferously, and that hurt internal unity, but what it helped was it gave a clear lead to their activists about where they stood on, a, on what a, the crucial question of the day in terms of the fight against racism in our society, right? You, you know, um, and similarly in Chicago, when the police shot Laquan McDonald, uh, when a, you know, police officer shot Laquan McDonald 16 times in the back, and there were emergency demonstrations, we took a position on that, and it, that hurt, like, it, there's a section of our members who are married to police officers in sections of the city, and that produced howls. And many unions wouldn't have taken that position because they didn't want to, wouldn't want to disrupt their internal unity. We're, go, we're in the middle of a contract fight. And we're hearing about that at school meetings. And yet, it's, I, I, I mean, you know, and, and it hasn't been easy. I've been beat up in a lot of meetings about it. But the truth of the matter is you have to look people in the eye and say, our union has a principle on racial justice. And you can't keep two sets of books on that. So anyway. I wasn't going to jump in, but I, I think I will just okay. to kind of close out, I, I mean, to move uh, the point. In terms of uh, a process, right at the same time we were fighting this anti-collective bargaining movement in our state, our state also went after voting rights at the same time, right? So they introduced a bill um, that would have rolled back the rights of uh, uh, people, voters in the state, uh, aimed 
primarily, uh, if you do the analysis on um, uh, African American voters requiring photo IDs, changing precinct hours, the whole nine yards. And it happened around the same time as we had just finished gathering signatures for um, our, uh, the Senate Bill 5 campaign. So we're in campaign mode trying to move forward. And as we're going out and having conversations with our allies and people in the community, and we're in cities like Cleveland and Columbus with large African-American populations, and people are learning that the voting, their voting rights have now been attacked, when we're asking for support for Senate Bill 5, they're saying to us, can we fight and try and repeal this voter bill at the same time the way you all did with Senate Bill 5? And I will tell you, many in our coalition did not necessarily see that fight as their fight. Now, they're out asking for support from a broad, diverse universe of people to come to our fight. And here's a particular constituency, mainly African-American, uh, who are saying we cannot allow a voter suppression bill to pass in the state with a, and go unanswered. And so we had this tug and pull. And I can remember talking to the head of the FOP, and he said, I'll be honest with you, PD, I'm not so sure my members will sign a petition to repeal this voter thing. Many of them think voter ID is something that needs to happen. And so we had a long conversation at that table. And again, the ground rules were set that all ideas are on the table, no sacred cows, no, no holding back, everybody's got a voice. And so as we continue to make the case, many of us uh, who understood that they needed African American, because people were telling us, if y'all don't support uh, this, uh, getting these signatures to turn back the voter suppression bill, don't look for us to mobilize in the black community, right? And so there was a long conversation. The leaders around that table didn't easily say, okay, forget it. But we had to um, get comfortable because they didn't think we could win it, number one. They didn't think we could get the signatures for it. But as it turned out, being willing to take a risk to see whether or not we could broaden our coalition of support, not just around issues around collective bargaining, it was a lot on the line in that campaign. We ultimately came to the conclusion we had built a pretty significant infrastructure that should have been capable of not just fighting on our issue, but the issues of our allies as well. And we put into place the practice and we, and we went to space too. We needed 200,000 some odd signatures again in a very short time. This time it was shorter. We had two weeks to get the signatures. But because we had built the infrastructure, we were able to go out, get the signatures, to, to put the issue on the ballot in the next year. And I guess the long and short of it is that African Americans supported the repeal of Senate Bill 5, 93% to 7, largest block. On the question of, of uh, and, 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 and again, we're not the only ones looking at the results, the other side's looking as well. When we got ready to think about what would the campaign look like in terms of the repeal of the voter suppression bill, the people that passed the bill did something very unprecedented. They came back in session in 2012 and said, oops, we probably overreached, right? Because they witnessed the broad coalition of people who came to the support of fighting against uh, collective bargaining. And I would just say, you know, we had to get comfortable because we weren't sure where that campaign was going. But we had a process, and the process was that we got to figure out how we fight on everybody's issues and not just a few, a few leaders who traditionally make the decision for all of us in the state of Ohio.